Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to CSS Nation. Uh, my name is Harry Mullen, and we have my co-host, uh, Pernell Husband. How you doing this morning, Pernell? Doing very well, Harry. How are you, man? Pretty good. Just a quick reminder, everybody, uh, we are on YouTube, and uh, we have a platform, or we're also uh, podcasting now. We're on uh, iTunes, uh, Spotify, and stuff, so be sure to subscribe and to go ahead and like our pages. Uh, so, uh, we can actually build our, uh, membership and stuff to get you out good information. So for now, I'm really excited today. Uh, we have our, uh, very first guests that are vendors, a uh, company called RIF Robotics. And, uh, we're going to be bringing on to the show, Kevin, uh, DeMarco and Sergio Garcia. So I'm really excited to hear what it is that they, uh, have in mind that is going to, in my opinion, uh, revolutionize the sterile processing department. So uh, without uh, further ado, let me go ahead and bring them into the uh, studio. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Good morning. Good. Doing well. Good morning, gentlemen. All right. So um, let's go ahead and start off and... Uh, uh, Kevin and uh, Sergio, do me a favor and uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves, your your roles in your company, and uh, about your journey. You know, I'm really interested in how you came to start your company, RIF Robotics. Yeah, sure. Um, so Sergio and I, we, we co-founded co this company, RIF Robotics, together um, just this last fall in 2020. Um, my background is I'm an electrical engineer uh, with a concentration in robotics and control theory. Um, and uh, Sergio and I met doing our PhDs at Georgia Tech back in 2012. Fantastic. Uh, Sergio, you have a background? Yeah, definitely. So uh, my background is also in electrical and computer engineering uh, from the University of Puerto Rico. And then, uh, like Kevin mentioned, we met at the uh, Humans Lab. Uh, at Georgia Tech doing our PhDs, and I specialized actually in technological rehabilitation projects. It wasn't until after I graduated that I started the path down robotics. Um, and then, uh, quick, I, I, to add a little bit more than Kevin mentioned, we also worked together at the uh, Research Institute of Georgia Tech for four years, I think. And our experience in robotics is what motivated us to start this company. Uh, so what is RIF Robotics? Yeah, sure. Um, so just this last fall, we decided to leave our you know, pretty steady jobs at Georgia Tech as research engineers um, uh, to see how we can bring robotics to healthcare. So we had previously been doing quite a bit with robotics and you know, government research and some, some pretty neat stuff and cutting edge stuff, but we weren't really seeing the immediate results. Uh, it was sort of stuff way out, way out into the future. And, and we kind of want, you know, we see that, you know, America kind of has a, a difficult healthcare system. And we're like, what, what, what can we do to, you know, help that situation out? So, uh, and my mom was a nurse her whole life in uh, Albany, New York. Uh, I've got an aunt that is currently has been a nurse her whole life. And she's an operating room nurse right now in Philadelphia. And then my uncle also is, is a nurse in Philadelphia. And so I've kind of been around, I've got an uncle who's a pharmacist. I've kind of been around people in healthcare my whole life. And I kind of always thought I would do something around healthcare. So, you know, I'm, I'm not young, I'm not old. And I decided I would, you know, I was getting to a decision point in my, my career where I was going to go down one route for the rest of my career, or I could kind of take my expertise and bring it to a different domain. Um, and so I, I talked to my mom recently uh, and my aunt, and they kind of were, kind of point us to the fact that uh, in the operating room, they have a lot of difficulty just with surgical case carts, and they're really heavy and difficult to move. And my aunt is constantly hurting her shoulders moving them. Um, and she said that, you know, they have the wrong tools in them, and she spends a lot of her time just counting tools. And she was like, can you make a robot that, she just said, sent me a text message, can you build a robot that builds a surgical case cart? Just a and, text message. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. And so I was like, okay, let me think about it. I was like, what's a case cart? I had no idea. So then we started really, you know, going down the YouTube rabbit hole of seeing what surgical technicians are doing in central sterile processing. And we, we saw what's going on and we and we're, it, it seemed like a very manual, tedious and often dangerous process for many technicians and nurses. And we were like, well, how can we make this easier on them and make it, you know, 
you know, may, maybe we can save the hospital's money and, you know, bring down healthcare costs by, by bringing the technology there. Well, an well, interesting, an interesting segue, segue into our into next, our next question. question. Do you guys have a mission or a mission statement? It, we know exactly where you're going or where you want to go with this, but is there a mission uh, that you can share with us as far as um, your company? Yeah, Sergio, you want, Sergio's good at it. Yeah, no, definitely. So, so overall, I ultimately, we want to be able to provide robotic solutions to improve uh, society's, what do you say, uh, quality of life. Um, and so we've looked, before we started this, on this healthcare path, we looked at different industries that could benefit from robotics. So one of our initial ideas was drones that could help firefighters or robots to help in agriculture. So I think that all these areas in society definitely need the same advancements in technology in order to improve the quality of life. And healthcare is definitely one of them. And like Kevin mentioned, his background and his experience in uh, healthcare definitely brought us down this path. And uh, now that he's, here we are. We're starting with healthcare. But like I said, the mission statement is definitely going to hopefully bring us to those other areas in society that will also improve the quality of life. Awesome. Okay, so um, this is kind of like the uh, the mission statement, but I'm more in like, or, you know, actually wanting to know uh, a little bit about your vision. So how is it you're going to change or revolutionize uh, what we do in sterile processing? Let's go in, you know, and into the future. You know, let's uh, talk about a little bit about your ideas. Nitty gritty type stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pre preface it with the fact that uh, we don't have a specific prototype we're going for first. So we're sort of in this, you know, we've kind of identified a problem in that there's, you know, potentially a lot of errors or injuries occurring, occurring in uh, sterile processing. And as engineers, what we want to do first is just go in and build a prototype and make something. And uh, we've learned uh, from other mentors in Atlanta who do startups and businesses that that is not the right approach to start off with. The first thing to do is really go in, understand the problems, understand the users, find out what they are identifying as problems first. Mm -hmm. And while we interview them, realize the fact that uh, they might come up with solutions, but they might not be the best solution because they're if they're head down doing something every day. Mm -hmm. So what we're, what we're actually right now over the next two to three months and for the last month or two, we've been interviewing other sterile processing managers and technicians and nurses around the country to find out what they think the problems are. And mm -hmm. without even trying to bias you know, we don't just come in and say, we're going to build a robot that does this for you, uh, like, because that sort of narrows their view on what is possible first. Or, you know, or maybe we're emphasizing a problem that isn't really a problem. So there's like this combination of the, the technical problem along with what is a real problem and is there an economic incentive for the hospital to actually pay for this technology? Otherwise, it's not really worth it for us to develop it if we just build it and then no one's going to use it and buy it, actually. So, but I can kind of give you some ideas about some things we've looked at, you know, and anyone who's in sterile processing might be able to say, yeah, that's kind of obvious that you might do that. So, you know, when uh, contaminated tools come from the operating room, surgical technicians take them out of maybe a disorganized tray. Uh, they might be sorted based on dirty and non-dirty tools. And then they have to pick them up, scrub them a little bit, maybe soak them. And that's a very manual process. And there's actually been quite a, a bit of advancement in manipulation with robot arms to be able to pick up small, fine tools, move them, use another tool to clean them, and then place them in an organized fashion so that maybe a more traditional factory process down the line can actually take it into uh, a cleaner and then take it out of that and put it into an autoclave and, and organization. So some of the things that we identified are, are difficult uh, for people to do right now are cleaning those tools because they have to be covered in all of that PPE while they're doing it. They've got to worry about getting stuck by sharp objects. Um, so we, we've identified that as a potential use, use case for robotics. Um, there are already some robotics being used to move trays around. Steris has a, a mobile robot that can move trays around um, that works with their autoclaves uh, in their system. Um, we've heard mixed, res 
you know, we, we've talked to some people who are using them at their hospital and some who don't. No one seems to love it or hate it. It just, it's a, a, a modern product. So it's good for us to learn because we had thought about that before we even knew about Steris doing it. And it's, it's good to see the, res, you know, the reactions before we even build anything. Uh, so maybe that's not as important to them. Um, other things, uh, there's been quite a bit of in industry for warehousing. There's, you know, they have robots that work pretty well that will take like a box, store it on a, you know, a shelf somewhere and be able to go retrieve that box and bring it back to a human. So that exists already being used by Amazon and other large warehousing companies already. Um, and so that sort of technology could easily be brought to the sterile processing to store and retrieve, you know, trays that have been sterilized already. Um, so that, that's one possibility. Um, sometimes those systems require sterile processing technicians to, uh, or the, the managers to organize the environment to be a certain way, which might be restrictive for sterile processing centers in hospitals. Um, but that's where kind of get, you know, the, the interesting part of a box comes around where you're building robots that safely operate around people and, uh, you know, can work in dynamic environments. And as engineers, that's the kind of stuff that we really love to do. And we like to find a good reason why we have to, you know, over-engineer something. Well, that's awesome because, as you may know, uh, still processing departments come in all shapes and sizes, right? Mm -hmm. And you have large hospitals, medium-sized hospitals. and that was going to be my next question, sort of, but you, you sort of dealt with it. What kinds of challenges does that existing infrastructure pose to um, solutions that you may bring to bear? And it sounds like you just um, addressed that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, there's, there's definitely been technology out for a decade or two even of kind of, you know, dumb robots that follow lines in warehouses. And that would be a difficult thing to use in the sterile processing. But even the last five years or so, there are quite a few companies that have come out that build mobile robots that build a 3D map of their environment. And you can kind of say, a human can say, go pick up that object over there and bring it over here. And they'll be able to do it with, you know, trays being moved and, uh, you know, desks being moved a little bit. And they can deal with these kind of dynamic environments fairly well. I mean, you're not sending something to mars right so right <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah yeah well you know um i i know that uh i mean how we uh were introduced to your company is that uh actually uh sergio had uh reached out to me via linkedin and uh we had a little conversation about uh your company and some of the things uh, that could be done with a robot, uh, for instance, uh, you know, a robot at the sink in decontamination. And uh, so I was a little bit curious as to, you know, how would that work? You know, as far as would the robot, uh, robot have some kind of, kind of uh, camera uh, in place to be able to identify defects in an instrument, be able to differentiate the difference between like rust or Mm -hmm. bio burden and for some people out there that don't know what bio burden is it's like uh soil it could be uh you know blood or tissue and stuff so uh how would that uh how would it work in the decontamination area so, so for that i want to i want to say that we want to solve all those problems <laughs> like kevin mentioned as engineers we look at a problem we immediately want to solve it so right now we are doing this customer discovery phase and validation phase where we're trying to prioritize which problems we need to address first. So to answer your question, like what it would take to, for example, determine defects in surgical tools, that is a complicated problem to solve that is kind of solved in, the, in theory in academia. Professors and graduate students, for example, are working on it, but so far as we know, there's no real solution for the real world application. Mm -hmm. And to give a little bit more detail about that, that not just requires some type of machine learning in order to, for example, first detect what tool you're looking at, right? So you have a camera and you have some machine learning computer vision program that can determine this is a scalpel that I'm holding and what type of scalpel. Then step two, you need to be able to determine what features it has compared to Let's say you're comparing a, a damage tool versus a working tool. So you have to be able to quantify and categorize those features in order to be able to automatically say this one is damaged because of X. 
Mm -hmm. And I think one of the biggest challenges that this solution might have is that the differences between similar tools is very, very small. So you can have potentially two scalpels that look exactly the same to the human eye, for example, but if you look at them closely or closer, then you might then tell the difference. So you need the sensors and the hardware in order to detect those minute or, you know, not minute, but small differences. But then you also need the machine machine learning infrastructure to train the model in order to learn these features. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, you have to consider, of course, that there's thousands and thousands of tools. So the more tools and more examples you have, you need to, uh, the more time and more complex your, your neural network is going to be. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, one of the biggest issues as well is just the amount of data that you need in order to train these neural networks. And so it's not as easy, right, especially now in COVID times, for one of us to just go into a hospital and start taking pictures of all the tools. So, so that's also something to consider. Um, mm -hmm when trying to apply computer vision for, you know, determining the bio weights or the uh, defects in a, in a potential tool. Um, and then as another side note for the bio weight problem, uh, that also required an extra set of sensors, for example, some hyperspectral sensors that can determine these um, foreign agents, if you will, on the tools. Uh, so, so, so that is definitely a problem that we're interested in pursuing it might not necessarily be the first one that we tackle, one, because of the technical difficulties that it implies, but it is definitely on our list because it, it definitely will help not just hospital staff, but also patients to minimize, for example, rate of infection. Right. Well, Absolutely. you know what? Uh, at this time, uh, I want to announce that we're going to go to a, a quick break. Uh, we're going to go to a news segment. So... Uh, fellas, uh, hang on for just a moment. Welcome to the news with from I on Sterile Processing Department. Hi, I am Salindra Barrafield. This news comes to you from Med City News, March the 23rd of 2021. Here in this article, we're going to talk about single-use device reprocessing, and they actually offer a template. Now, single-use device reprocessing is the most successful and widespread example of circular healthcare economy. Now, this is how it works. The medical device labeled single use by the manufacturer are collected after procedures and they're stored. Next, a representative picks up the device and ships them to the reprocessing plant. Here, they are traced, registered, clean, tested, and sterilized. At this point, the hospital can purchase a reprocessed device for a fraction of the price they pay for a new device. This process is controlled by the FDA. Reprocessors can only perform these services after receiving a device-specific clearance from the FDA. Now, the highlights here are single-use device reprocessing provides important cost savings to hospitals in the United States. Hospitals can save more than $400 million per year through the use of reprocessed single-use devices. One of the biggest areas for reprocessing savings is in cardiology, where U.S. hospitals could save a combined $800 million per year in saving. Now, they have the framework, but I just pulled out a couple of bullet points, so here we go. Identify medical services supplies that are expensive and single use. Perform a cost benefit analysis to determine that reuse doesn't imply added cost. Determine if the selected supplies can be safely cleaned and reused. Create a collection and reuse infrastructure. This includes collecting containers in which to place used supplies, instructions about how to handle used supplies, signage, new SOPs, and routines for storing and buying back supplies. Is your department part of a single-use reprocessing or recycling program? We would love to hear from you. You can find me on Facebook at ILSPD or join my group, Sterile Processing Grapevine. You can find me on ILSPD.com and leave me a message. Again, this is news you can use from ION Sterile Processing. You guys go out there and continue to be great. Until next time. We are interviewing today uh, Kevin DeMarco and Sergio Garcia from RIF Robotics. Uh, so far, this has been a very interesting conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And we're going to go ahead and uh, pick it up again uh, right where uh, we left off. So, guys, anytime um, there's a serious advancement in technology in an area, 
that has not had technology, robotic technology particularly, um, there's, there's always some concern about displacement of people. I know that you guys, um, being PhDs, um, have wrestled with this question. How do you approach that particular dynamic of um, advancing technology versus uh, workers and, and people who are currently uh, doing this work? Yeah, for sure. It's something that we, we think about a lot. <clears throat> Um, and in fact, it's one of the reasons I feel like we picked healthcare because we feel like, I feel like that's one of those industries that um, is an industry that, you know, isn't just about consumerism or making things. It's about providing health to society. And, <clears throat> and it's true that whenever any new technology comes around, uh, people will lose, certain people will lose their jobs and their jobs will change as well. You know, the thing, same thing happened when, you know, sorry, I got my, my phone's ringing. <laughs> <clears throat> Same thing happened. You know, we don't have elevator operators anymore. Uh, we used to have those. Um, and, and now, but now there's elevator technicians and repair people. So there, there are always changes in technology and that shifts where jobs go. Um, and that also means that <clears throat> society needs to provide education as people change their types of jobs as well. Uh, so I'm a really big proponent of continuing education for, for everybody. Um, but we definitely see how, you know, people could be worried about robotics coming to sterile processing. Uh, but like Sergio said, some of these problems are so technically difficult. Mm -hmm. It is probably going to be decades before it is really fully automated in any way. So it, it is a long time. And then even then there are going to be people who are managing the robots and people who are working with the robots. Um, I know in there, there's this idea of something called a, a cobot which is a collaborative robot. And you'll hear that term a lot in industry. And there's a lot of cobots being used in, in warehouses and in manufacturing today. Mm -hmm. And that's because even with all our advancements, robots can do a lot, but people still are required to have high level thinking and decision making to help those robots figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is take those jobs that are what we call in, in robotics, uh, you know, dirty, dull, and dangerous for people. So dirty jobs, cleaning up contaminated tools. And those tools are also dangerous for people. You know, there's a lot of, we've also heard that there's a lot of back injuries and shoulder injuries in sterile processing. That's a dangerous thing for people. Maybe right now in modern society, it's not the best thing for people to be hurting themselves at their jobs. <laughs> yeah, so it's gotten so complicated to clean an endoscope that They'll have the technician have a stack of cards that they'll go through every step and hold that card up and have a, a camera take a picture of what step they're working on. And they'll, be, they'll do that for 100, 200 steps. And if they make a mistake, that could mean a patient uh, having an infection and, and die. So um, those are the kind of things that are really mission critical that we're trying to tackle first. And I think people who, who care about the outcomes in hospitals and patient care are gonna be okay with those tasks being replaced by a robot. So I think, and again, as we all know, with advancing technology, and you alluded to it, um, comes opportunity. Opportunity mm -hmm. um, for relearning, um, opportunity to advance yourself. Um, so there's always opportunity and nothing brings opportunity like change and technology. And it, and it sounds like, um, you know, that's um, in our future. Um, you guys have alluded to a, uh, on a couple of occasions that um, this particular endeavor that is roboticizing um, an industry that has not seen any of that type of technology. So what are we looking at as far as in our lifetimes, um, walking into a department where um, these robots are doing their thing and are working alongside people. What kind of timeline maybe we look, may uh, we be looking at? That's a good question. Um, it's it's a two prong question, right? Because one is the actual uh, advancements in technology, like how how well uh, is the technology developed. And then the other one is how open the industry is to accept 
and bring in this technology. Um, in my experience, I think the developments and advancements in technology will not be the limitation to get to the point, like you described, where you can walk into a hospital and see robots working alongside humans. I think that roboticists and engineers and the academia and industry are working pretty fairly constantly uh, in solving these problems. And I would just to give out a, a number, I think in the next five, at most I think 10 years, the technology is going to be solved and well proven. Now, I think the limitation will then be the industry wanting to adapt and adopt these technologies and bring them in, uh, especially in healthcare. We, we're slowly learning that Healthcare and hospitals is one of those industries that are somewhat reluctant to bring in new uh, technological innovation. That's that's my that's my experience, my opinion. I don't know, Kevin, if you have another different view of that timeline. Yeah, I, I think yeah. So our approach is, I guess, a little bit more tactical immediately, where we are you know trying to identify a first application to tackle. And once we do that, we feel like we can have some sort of minimal viable products in about six months where we can get in there and really start testing it in a hospital, partner with a hospital where we can try it out on a daily basis. Um, and then as is true in many healthcare companies, we'll probably have to raise some sort of external funding in order to get the FDA approval for it as well. So even though it's not touching patients, it's it's you know important enough that we're going to need FDA approval, probably five ten k approval for any device we create, and that takes you know significant funding, and so we'll have to get that funding, um, and then I would say you know and then it's sort of like a process of trying to get that that product out into hospitals, and that could take one to three years, and then you know while we're doing that, working on you know improving that product, but also bringing what's the next step. So then that would be another three to six years for the next thing in that chain. So I think Sergio's timeline is basically, you know, we, we agree on that. It's, you know, about one to three years for a first prototype, another three to five years for the next next thing in the line, and just keep building up as we go along. Well, fantastic. Hey, uh, real quick, uh, everybody, um, just want to let you know it's time for another uh, commercial break. So at this point, uh, you know, in our talk, we talked a little bit about education and opportunity. And so with further, no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring in that opportunity for those of you that are watching. Well, welcome back to the show. Again, we have uh, Kevin DeMarco and Sergio Garcia from RIF uh, Robotics. I'm telling you, this, you know, I'm really enjoying this conversation. And uh, it's actually going by uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we only have a, a few more questions to ask you, gentlemen. I know that uh, with all the technology uh, ideas uh, with the robotics that you're thinking about, I know you have a busy schedule, but we're uh, we're almost there. So... Um, let me go ahead and continue on. 
Um, we talked about uh, opportunity uh, that's there with these robotics working side by side and stuff. Uh, the question I have for you, though, is what is it that you're going to be needing from the industry, you know, from managers and technicians in order to make your ideas a reality? Yeah. Um, so what we need is sort of a, a willingness from uh, managers and surgical technicians to kind of let us know what their problems are and how they currently solve them. And for them to point at, you know, aspects that, you know, maybe there's a process around some, something to make it safe or, or make sure it, it, things are clean. But maybe there are also things that sort of don't have a rigid process around them and just happen to get clean correctly. So we kind of need people. So what we're going to be doing is over the next few months going and shadowing and interviewing people who work in these sterile processing departments and see what they do and see if we can quantify it and make it, you know, as quantitative as possible on what they're doing. Um, so specifically, yeah, we kind of need them to be open about what they're doing so that we can help them, you know, replace the tasks that they don't like doing and are dangerous first. And awesome. Awesome. I am too. I'm uh, thoroughly enjoying the conversation. Now, you talked about um, going into facilities and working alongside technicians and asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, that's the only way to do it, right? Um, do you have hospital partners or a partner that you're currently working with um, on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of help you uh, get to the root of some of the issues um, that we have in the field? Yeah, so we did write uh, early, uh, late last year, December 2020, we submitted a National Science Foundation a small business uh, grant proposal. And as part of that, we had two uh, hospitals in Atlanta where we had their sterile processing managers. We, we spoke with them. We told them what we were doing, that we're doing this research on how to bring robotics to sterile processing. And so there are two local hospitals in Atlanta that agreed to sort of have communications with us but they're still having restrictions about COVID, so we can't quite go in and talk to them yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition, we've literally you know, been doing the startup thing. We're cold calling hospitals across the country. And we and we are on LinkedIn, and we're finding people through there. And we've stumbled across some great uh, sterile processing communities on LinkedIn where you know, I will we'll message people and say, hey, uh, we just want to interview you and ask you what you like and don't like about your job in sterile processing. Mm -hmm. um, and through that, we've been able to have some connections where people are, you know, we can't, you know, we're, we're sort of in like almost having, we kind of have to have like real, uh, agree, you know, legal agreements with them before we can say their names out loud. So I don't, I don't want to do that yet for, sure. for their privacy. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, that is in the works and, uh, when, you know, when we actually have the real legal agreements, you know, we're going to be excited to announce those, but there's a couple hospitals on the East coast that we're going to be visiting. And we're pretty sure we'll be visiting in the next two months. Just so you know, Harry and I have been in the field for a thousand years. <laughs> we have a combined 40 plus years of experience in the sterile processing industry, both hospital based and commercial. Hmm. We've operated and worked at every single level from an hourly wage technician all the way up to a director of several facilities for a hospital chain so again and you know we could take this conversation offline at some point mm -hmm. um but with our combined experience and insight um in this industry and we obviously had you on harry booked you guys so we love the idea and we've kind of heard some of these concepts Mm -hmm. um, in the past, but I certainly believe um, that you know there's an opportunity um, for us to work together. Um, I think we have a um, a, a mutual uh, interest here. So please do keep that in mind and keep us in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we, yeah no, we, I, we, I mentioned it earlier. That so that's that's exactly how we uh, came to meet. I just. I'm Harry on LinkedIn. 
And as soon as I saw all his credentials and the SPD, he's like, I'm definitely messing with him. Like a mile <laughs> long, right? Those credentials, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <the> jackpot. <laughs> yeah. No, we de we definitely understand, and we are very open to. We, we know we're going to have to build a big team of people and a diverse set of people that with different skills and backgrounds in order to, you know, once you know, work to identify the problem, build a team that can actually run a company and can communicate with people in hospitals. And so you need people who've been working in hospitals their whole lives to communicate with the people in hospitals. Surgeon, I know a lot about robotics, and mm -hmm. we're learning about the industry. But we're not the people that are going to be able to seamlessly communicate with the hospital sure. uh, managers, I would say. Um, so we're doing the best we can. But and then so yeah, we're going to have to bring on the you know the tech you know surgical technician managers. We're going to have to bring on a chief medical officer at some point, which we're you know we're thinking will probably have to be some sort of surgeon that's interested in this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, we're going to have to build our team up so that we can get external funding and make the people with all the money feel happy about giving us money and then so that we can go, you know, get that, you know, make a solid product, get through the FDA process, make sure everything's really safe so that we can really, you know, deliver a product that is, you know, uh, effective and affordable and, um, and revolutionary and changes yep. the industry and mm -hmm. saves patients lives and all that good stuff. We really love what you guys are doing and where you're yeah. headed with this. Yeah. Great. Appreciate it. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, just want to let you know, you know, as uh, Pernell uh, said, we, you know, 40, actually, I think 30, I think we have closer to uh, 55 years. I, I alone have been in the industry for 33 years. Dude, I just and, turned 27. What are you talking about? Yeah. So, I mean, we're close to, pretty close to 60 years. Well, actually, 27, 33. I think, yeah. Um, uh, I my toes. Uh, yeah, close to 60 years and stuff. But, uh, you know, one of the things uh, we definitely have is we have a very strong network of uh, professionals uh, throughout the country. And, um, you know, we'd love to be able to help you to be perhaps set up an advisory council when the time comes when yeah. you're needing something like that. Uh, we have industry experts on the West Coast, East Coast, in the center, from Colorado, Texas to Michigan. Indiana. Yeah, <laughs> probably the islands. Yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, what is it that you'd like to share uh, with the audience uh, before you go? And, you know, exactly, RIF, what right. does that mean? What does it stand for? Yeah, so it's sort of, you know, and, you know, we're very early, and I'm, you know, an engineer and researcher, so I'm not great at, you know, coming up with always creative names for things. Uh, but the, but I, I also, I, I'm a guitar player, and so, RIF is actually kind of like a riff, and the idea is it's sort of like riffing or robots that feel, are able to improvise in their settings, in their, in their dynamic environments. So that's sort of where it came up from. I, I had a long conversation with my, with my brother about it, and he's like, oh, riff, it's like a guitar riff, you're improvising. And I was like, oh, that's cool, I like that. So, you know, I think sometimes surgery, you know, we, we call it riff robotics, and all the people say RIF robotics. And I don't correct anybody because I'm still questioning how to say it. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. I, lo I uh, love it. You like get it. to be on riffing, um, improvising. How do you say that word, Harry? Improvisation. improvisation. Yeah, yeah, man. Just like some good old jazz. Yeah, yeah exactly. I love it. I love exactly. it. I just made up a new word, I think. Improvis improvisation. <laughs> <laughs> improvisation. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, and then I guess, you know, Sergio, do you have anything else you think people should know about or uh, about our company? Not really, not really. This is, I, I guess I want to say that, so this is the first time I've ever done anything business-related. I've been in the academia all my life, and it's exciting. So anyone who's listening who is having doubts about starting their own business or jumping into something new, just, it is scary. It is definitely scary, but it is also really, really exciting. So that's that's very general comment right there on how I've, I've been feeling about this process. Um, so here's to uh, great things to come for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know what, uh, put it this way, audience, uh, as Sergio said, it is scary, but, uh, one thing I have to add is that you'll never be paid what you're worth until you go out on your own and do it. Companies will definitely utilize your skills, but they're never going to pay you, uh, ultimately for those skills. So, 
Uh, with that said, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for uh, coming on to our show. Uh, I think this has been an awesome episode. And uh, once again, thank you so much. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Yeah, I appreciate the invitation. All have right. Okay, with that said, uh, what, Pernell, what did you think about the, uh, those guests? You know, I thought um, that both gentlemen obviously knew what they were talking about. Um, they know that sterile processing could benefit from um, robotic technology. I happen to agree with them. It's pretty exciting. It's yeah. not going to happen tomorrow, but at least we know, and my dog agrees, at least we know that there's smart people out there looking at this problem and asking questions from the source. Um, I think these guys are awesome, and I wish them the best of luck in their endeavors. Absolutely. And uh, with that said, uh, one last question uh, for you, uh, per uh, Purnell. Uh, any last questions or statements? We'll be back. <laughs>